In this video, we'll look at 10 fun facts about the T6 Texan II. Number 10, the parking brake. So you strap into the airplane before engines start and are rocking through the interior inspection checklist when you arrive at step 25, parking brake reset. How is this step accomplished? Well, that depends really. First, a quick T6 brake system refresher. A cable runs from the parking brake handle to the brake valve. Pulling out on the handle closes that valve. This prevents the return of fluid. The brake discs are then locked in place so the wheels can't turn. Your Systems One study guide says to activate the parking brake, push the brakes and simultaneously activate the handle. No contradiction found in the T6-1 about this process of push the brakes while pulling and turning the handle. But here's the rub. When the handle is out and turned clockwise, which it will be on the flight line when you arrive at the jet, the brake valve is closed and the parking brake is set. But over time, pressure in the brake lines bleed off and therefore the brake lines need to be repressurized. What you aren't told in academics or the dash one is the brake valve is a one-way check valve. Once closed, it'll let fluid in, but not out. So if the parking brake handle is already out, meaning the brakes were set earlier, they just need repressurized. There is no need to release the parking brake handle and pull it back out. In step 25, to reset the parking brake when the handle is already out, simply press the top of the rudder pedals a couple of times until you feel maximum resistance. Give it a try on your next sortie. Number nine, hot brakes. Since we're talking about the brake system, let's talk about hot brakes. Step one of the engine shutdown checklist is set the parking brake. As you see, this step includes a caution that says do not set the parking brake when hot brakes are suspected. This is the only place in the dash one where the word hot brakes is actually used. There is, however, a warning about what to do if you suspect overheated brakes. Which brings us to the question, when should I suspect that I have hot brakes in the T6? Some people will have you believe 80 knots is the hot brake speed. That is false. What the dash one says about 80 knots is one, use caution braking above this speed as braking is sensitive and you are susceptible to popping a tire since we don't have anti-skid. And two, above 80 knots, the nose wheels should be off the ground during landing and touch and goes. So a little background information on hot brakes. Most aircraft larger than the T6 have a no kidding hot brake speed, which varies based on aircraft weight, ground speed at time of brake application, runway slope, outside air temperature, pressure altitude, and taxi distance. All that said, the T6 does not actually have a hot brake speed. We do, however, have a maximum braking speed, known as VB. The Dash 1 says maximum braking speed is the max speed an aircraft can be brought to a stop without exceeding the max design energy capability of the brakes. As you probably already know, brakes convert kinetic energy into heat. Once the limit is reached, which happens to be 3.96 million foot-pounds in the T6, the brakes fade and will not work. When it comes to aborting a takeoff, there are two big factors, runway length and brake energy capability. At some point during takeoff, aborting is no longer an option because you'll either run out of runway or smoke the brakes. You'll learn more about that in future aircraft you fly. For the T6, if you run the brake energy chart, you'll see you'd have to take off with the absolute worst case scenario to reach 3.96 million foot-pounds. At 43 degrees Celsius, max gross weight, taking off in 10 knots of tailwind, and applying brakes at 120 knots indicated, which would be 130 knots ground speed, we would then hit 3.96 million foot-pounds of brake energy absorption. But here's the thing, if you're taking off from Vance's 5,000 foot runway, in this scenario, you'd be going off the end of the runway at a very high rate of speed. So hot brakes is no longer a primary concern. If you look at the max abort speed chart for this worst case scenario, if you attempt to abort above 65 knots, you'll be going off the end of the runway. In which case, forget about braking as it's time to eject. So with all that said, when should I suspect hot brakes in the T6? Well, the dash one just says, don't set the parking brake after maximum effort braking. There are no defined parameters here, but maximum effort braking would be needed during a heavy weight, no flap landing on a short runway. 
In short, you must use sound pilot judgment for making the hot brakes call. The conservative answer is if you land at heavy weight on a short runway or aborted at or above rotation speed on takeoff, shut down after clearing the runway. Don't set the parking brake, point into the wind of able, relay to ATC you need crash, fire, and rescue support, and exit the aircraft in the manner you deem appropriate for that situation. Once out of the airplane, stay away from the main gear and shock the nose gear if able. Maintenance will tow the aircraft back to the ramp. Number 8. Turbulence Penetration Speed Section 5 of the Dash 1 contains the T6 VN diagram and in Section 7 you can find information about turbulence and thunderstorm penetration. The flight operating strength of an aircraft is presented on a graph whose vertical scale is based on load factor. This diagram is referred to as a VG or VN diagram, velocity versus load factor. A VN diagram defines the structural, aerodynamic, and airspeed limitations of the aircraft. Inside the lines define the normal operating envelope of the aircraft. Every aircraft has its own diagram that is valid at a certain weight and altitude. This chart represents the T6G limits at max takeoff weight. Looking at this diagram, we are seeing the T6 limit load factor and aerodynamic stall limit. Limit load factor is the greatest amount of G-forces the aircraft can sustain without risk of permanent deformation or damage. Aerodynamic stall limit are the curved lines that start at zero and intersect the load limit lines. These lines represent the total load factor that can be generated at a particular airspeed before a stall occurs. One use of the chart is to determine the minimum airspeed required to sustain a specific G-loading. For example, the minimum airspeed necessary to sustain a 4G turn is approximately 180 knots at sea level and 210 knots at 31,000 feet MSL. This is why 200 to 220 is the minimum airspeed to begin the G-awareness exercise. If you were to attempt a 4G GX at 150 knots, for example, at 3 Gs, the wing would stall. In this scenario, the aircraft is in an accelerated stall. Applying this aerodynamic limit principle, you see on the chart that at sea level, you cannot overstress the aircraft with positive Gs below approximately 195 knots indicated because you will stall first. With that in mind, in extremely rough air, as in thunderstorms or frontal conditions, it is wise to reduce the speed to below the turbulent air penetration speed limit known as VG, which is 195 knots in the T6. As you see, the Dash 1 recommends 180 knots if flying through turbulent air. 180 knots provides a good balance between the 195 knot positive asymmetric maneuver limit of 4.7 Gs and the heavyweight clean configuration 1G stall speed of 85 knots. All that said, don't fly in or near thunderstorms. Turning around, altering your course or altitude, or diverting is recommended by Air Force Handbook 11-203 Vol 1 and required by AFI 11-202 Vol 3. Number 7. Thrust Angle As you probably already know, in the T6, adding power causes a pitch up and left yaw. Thrust angles are incorporated into most single-engine airplanes to help counteract this tendency especially if it is a high wing or high thrust aircraft. If you look straight on at the spinner, you'll notice it is canted a couple degrees to the left and very slightly downward. This is called side thrust and down thrust. This off-center engine mounting is more obvious when you look at the entire engine from the firewall to the spinner. Thrust angles can be left, right, up, or down, depending on the design of the aircraft and where the engine is mounted in relation to the center of drag. Aircraft with the most down thrust are high wing aircraft, and aircraft with the most side thrust are little aircraft with a lot of thrust. The yawing forces produced by a rotating propeller can be considerable, as is the case in the T6. This left turning tendency is counteracted slightly by angling the engine and propeller a couple degrees to the right as viewed from the cockpit looking forward. This is called right side thrust angle. The slight down angling is needed when the thrust line is below the tail and the wing, which tends to pull the aircraft up when you increase torque. In low wing aircraft like the T6, 
the center of drag is lower, which provides for increased longitudinal stability seen in the red arrow between the wingtips. And less down thrust is required, even though the PT6 engine produces a considerable amount of torque. Number six, split flaps. There are four main types of aircraft flaps, plane, split, slotted, and fowler. Flaps increase both lift and drag, thereby reducing an aircraft's stall speed, allowing for slower takeoff and landing airspeeds, and increased descent angles without an increase in airspeed. The principle of stall speed reduction is simple enough. Flaps increase wing surface area, wing camber, or both, thus increasing lift. The stall speed reduction benefit is twofold. It allows for shorter runway length requirements and increases crash survivability due to reduced ground speeds. The T6 has split flaps, which are common to high performance aircraft with thin wings, as there is little room for the construction of a more complex flap system. Chances are in your flight training in small reciprocating engine aircraft, you flew an aircraft that had plane flaps, which is a simple and effective way of increasing lift. Split flaps produce a slightly larger increase in lift coefficient than plane flaps. However, the disadvantage of split flaps is they cause a large increase in drag during even small angular deflections. This can be easily seen in wind tunnel testing. When the flap splits from the wing, airflow beneath the wing is deflected downward, which increases lift. Air flowing above the wing, however, is almost unaffected and flows smoothly rearward. This divergence of airflow at the wing's trailing edge creates an undesirable turbulent wake behind the flap. Lowering the flaps to takeoff in the T6 greatly increases lift coefficient without noticeably increasing drag, resulting in a lowered takeoff speed. Lowering the flaps to landing, however, increases the drag more than lift, as well as causes a larger divergence of airflow at the wing's trailing edge. When flying with the flaps at landing, the airframe tends to rumble because there's a good deal of turbulent air hitting the elevator. Number five, the firewall shutoff handle. The firewall shutoff handle is a very important safety feature in the T6. As you know, this is a bold face step for engine fires and departing the prepared surface. This handle serves three purposes in the T6. When pulled, three butterfly valves are closed at the firewall if the handle is pushed back in, the valves will reopen. Closing these three valves prevents smoke and fumes from entering the environmental system and stops the flow of fuel and hydraulic fluid to the engine, thus minimizing the risk of fire and smoke in the cockpit. Let's take a closer look at what pulling the firewall shutoff handle does. Looking in the single point refueling bay, pulling up on the handle closes the fuel shutoff valve and here you see it opening and closing as the handle is pulled and then pushed back in. On the opposite side of the nose, in the right forward access door, the hydraulic and bleed air firewall shutoff valves are closing and opening as the handle is pulled and then reset. When the firewall shutoff handle is pulled with the engine running, it can take up to 30 seconds for the engine to shut down, but typically shutdown occurs closer to 10 seconds. One interesting scenario that is possible in the T6 is broken PCL throttle linkage, which means torque cannot be adjusted with PCL movement. In this scenario, placing the PCL to off may not result in engine shutdown. The firewall shutoff handle would then need to be pulled to shut down the engine. In this case, the propeller will likely not immediately go into the feather position. With a windmilling prop that cannot be feathered, make high key 5,000 feet AGL rather than 3,000. Number four, propeller operation. Since we're on the subject of the propeller, let's talk about how it operates. As you know, the propeller produces thrust, which counteracts drag. Thrust produces velocity, which produces lift, a key component of flight. Propellers are basically aircraft wings that spin. The discussion on propeller aerodynamics and design is a lengthy one, so let's just hit the highlights. Propellers have camber and prop twist. The prop blade velocity varies greatly from the hub to the tip, where the tip is traveling at very close to the speed of sound. The twist from the hub to the tip is to maintain a constant angle of attack along the entire propeller 
for equal lift amount from hub to tip. You'll recall from the thrust angle discussion that camber and angle of attack are the two components of coefficient of lift. In short, spinning propellers create lift, which varies primarily from propeller velocity and angle of attack. The T6 has a variable pitch, constant speed propeller that rotates at 2000 RPM. Increased thrust is produced by increasing the blade angle of attack. Each pitch condition is the measure of the angle between the plane of rotation of the propeller and the cord line of the blade. When feathered, the propeller blades are aligned nearly straight into the wind, approximately 86 degrees for the T6, streamlining it and minimizing drag. When fine, also known as low pitch, the T6 propeller blade angle is approximately 15 degrees from the reference plane. The propeller blades will be at low pitch at low speeds and low throttle settings. When coarse, also known as high pitch, the T6 propeller pitch varies between max angle of attack and low pitch. The T6 propeller system is designed to maintain a constant speed of 2000 RPM, 100% MP, during most flight conditions. In flight, we want the propeller somewhere between fine and coarse pitch to provide thrust, but if the engine isn't running, we want the propeller feathered to minimize drag. A low pitch prop angle, also known as a windmilling prop, produces a ton of drag, which is not conducive to gliding. So how does the propeller go from the feather position to the fine setting? Simply put, oil pressure pushes a sliding piston, which moves the propeller out of the feather position. Diving a little deeper, the propeller interface unit, PIU for short, is where much of the propeller operation is governed. The PIU contains a prop servo valve, feather solenoid, overspeed and electronic governor, and an oil pump and pressure regulator. We'll talk more about these components later. To vary the propeller angle, the PIU responds to power requests from the PMU by regulating oil pressure to the pitch change mechanism. As the PIU increases oil pressure, the sliding piston is forced forward, rotating the propeller blades towards low pitch. If the engine fails during flight, oil pressure to the pitch change mechanism is lost and the propeller moves to feather via propeller counterweights and a feathering spring. Number three, the prop system circuit breaker. Now that we have a basic understanding of propeller operation, let's talk about the function of the prop sys circuit breaker. Many pilots new to the T6 don't understand the purpose of this circuit breaker, which is not ideal considering it's a boldface step for uncommanded prop feather. The fact that we have a boldface that calls for pulling a circuit breaker is pretty remarkable in itself. After all, circuit breakers are not routinely used to open a circuit and remove power from a component. That is what switches are for. Before talking about the function of the prop sys circuit breaker itself, Let's have a quick discussion on electrical circuits. A simple aircraft electrical circuit consists of a power source, a switch, a circuit breaker, and the electrical component. Take the map light, for example. It receives power from the forward battery bus through the utility circuit breaker. Pretty simple. But there's usually a lot more going on if you look at a wiring diagram. This is a picture of the T6 electrical load distribution. Here you see relays, diodes, current limiters, a shunt, and electrical buses. Luckily, we don't need an electrical engineering degree to understand the basics of the prop sys circuit breaker. You just need to know that for an electric component to operate, it must have power and ground. The function of a circuit breaker is to, well, break the electrical circuit, which stops the component from operating. Circuit breakers are a safety feature. They pop if there's an electrical short to prevent fire. As you know, fire anywhere other than in the combustion chamber of the engine or coming out of the afterburner of a jet engine is a bad thing. Okay, now we can talk about the purpose of the prop sys circuit breaker. The feather dump solenoid receives power through this breaker. In normal operation, the feather dump solenoid is not powered. When you place the PCL to cut off, micro switches are activated that power the feather dump solenoid valve, which in turn dumps oil pressure from the propeller. With that in mind, should the feather dump solenoid receive power with the PCL between idle and max, the prop will feather. Therefore, an uncommanded prop feather is an electrical malfunction, not a mechanical one. 
A feathered prop is indicated by NP less than 40%. By pulling the breaker, we de-energize the feather dump solenoid, allowing oil to go back into the pitch change mechanism, moving the propeller back into a flight angle. This brings us to the last important point regarding this circuit breaker. If you've done all three steps of the bold face, the propeller will not rapidly feather in the event the engine fails or is shut down by the pilot. The dash one reminds us with the PMU off, it will not send a signal to the prop servo valve to drain propeller oil. With the prop sys circuit breaker out, the feather dump solenoid will not receive power and will also not dump oil pressure. In this situation, there is no electronic signal commanding the prop to go into feather. The counterweights and feathering spring may eventually overcome the oil pressure, but that can take considerable time. If you push the circuit breaker back in, however, the feather dump solenoid receives power and will dump the oil pressure. Now, the counterweights and feathering spring can feather the prop, resulting in a much better glide range. Number two, overspeed governor check. Just when you thought you knew everything about the propeller system, there's even more we can talk about. Up to now, we've talked about how the propeller is electronically governed, but now let's talk about the mechanical governor. We talked about uncommanded prop feather boldface in great detail, but as you know, that boldface procedure has three titles. Now, let's talk about uncommanded power changes. Without going into great detail, the PMU regulates engine power for smooth, linear power changes and overboost protection. If the PMU were to malfunction, it may cause uncommanded power changes or loss of power. Boldface applies. By placing the PCL to mid-range before turning the PMU switch off, we are helping prevent an engine overboost situation. Now the engine and propeller system are in manual mode. What exactly does that mean to you as a pilot? For one, be smooth with the power changes. For two, you have an engine problem and this would be a good time to execute the precautionary emergency landing checklist and land at the nearest suitable airport. Systems wise though, if the PMU or PIU fails, propeller RPM is automatically regulated by the backup system. The mechanical flyweight overspeed governor resets to maintain 100 plus or minus two NP at 2000 RPM. Mechanical governing is accomplished by centrifugal force moving counterweights, sometimes called flyweights, outward causing oil pressure to dump. With the decreased oil pressure, the feathering spring will drive the blade toward course pitch to keep NP within limits. NP may peak above 100% during power changes, then return to govern range. During the overspeed governor check, you are turning the PMU off and checking that the mechanical governor keeps NP within 100 plus or minus 2%. If NP fails to remain within these tolerances, maintenance will have to change the PIU. Number one, external power. There's a lot of technique and misunderstandings being taught about using external power for T6 engine starting. Let's debunk a few of them. For starters, there's only one scenario in which you absolutely must use external power for engine start. Know what it is? If not, you're about to say, oh yeah, I knew that. During the over the rail inspection, you clear the propeller area, flip the battery switch to on, and proceed to set your seat height, check that the FDR light goes out, and check your battery voltage, fuel, and temperatures. There you are. External power is only required when the battery is less than 23.5 volts. There are a number of times where external power is recommended though, as you see here, the Dash 1 says consider using external power for engine motoring. This is especially true when the engine start is aborted on a battery start attempt. There is no point in motoring using battery power and then attempting another start using just battery. It didn't work the first time, it probably won't work the second. There's another place in the Dash 1 that basically says consider using external power under certain circumstances, and that is in the abort start procedure checklist. Note 5 says a weak battery, high OAT, high pre-start ITT, high density altitude, or tailwind may cause the PMU to abort a battery start. Note that it does not mention what voltage constitutes a weak battery, nor does it say a specific temperature that constitutes high OAT and ITT. In conclusion, the Dash 1 only requires external power use when battery voltage is below 23.5. It is also worth noting that the Dash 1 says 
Battery starts are the primary method for engine starting. Keep that in mind before you make the crew chief push that heavy power cart because you were taught an overly conservative technique. Worst case scenario, the battery start doesn't work and now you get some practice motoring the engine. And there you have it, 10 fun facts about the T6. Now you can wow your IPs with your newfound knowledge. This is Gas Singh. Stay in the books and just say no to gouge.